class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right, so how's everybody doing today? Welcome to the African History Network show. It's Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and we are live. So I was on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, and Roland talked about, uh, we had a good show Friday, but he talked about uh, Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly that used to be on Fox News and then she went to uh, NBC News. And she went to NBC and uh, Megyn Kelly has a history of making idiotic, uh, racially insensitive remarks previously. Well, Megyn Kelly on her podcast talked about um, the, we know the uh, new season of the NFL started this past Thursday, uh, Thursday, uh, September 9th, and the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is being performed at uh, NFL games this season. The NFL announced that uh, this past summer. And this is part of their initiative uh, to focus on social injustice. Uh, the NFL uh, has a 10, is going to invest 20, $250 million over the next 10 years dealing with uh, fighting for social justice initiatives. And this came out of the, a lot of this came out of the protests uh, spearheaded by Colin Kaepernick, which is why I'm wearing, wearing my Colin Kaepernick shirt. That's why I'm wearing my Colin Kaepernick shirt right now, because I don't watch the NFL at all. Not even the Super Bowl or the Sucker Bowl, as some people call it. So she made some negative remarks slamming the Black National Anthem being performed uh, at the uh, NFL games. OK, but then also Bill Maher on his show uh, this week uh, on HBO that I don't watch. Uh, real time with Bill Maher. He made some uh, negative comments as well. He criticized the NFL for playing the Black National Anthem. Now, his comments were a little different than Megyn Kelly's. Um, both are very tone deaf. Both are very tone deaf and, and, and show uh, that they don't understand history. OK, so we're going to talk about that. Now, on my show Friday, we dealt with this some um, Friday. I, I talked about Megyn Kelly's comments on Friday, but not Bill Maher's comments. I didn't have a chance to talk about Bill Maher's comments. There's a good article from the Hill.com that deals with Bill Maher's comments. Um, so go back and watch the show Friday. People have been uh, watching it on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, my show from uh, Friday, September 10th. And we're going to re-air that on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. After this show is over with today, we're going to re-air um, re that show from Friday. Um, so be sure to follow me on my Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotel, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So we're going to... Uh, what I did Friday was I dealt with some of the history of Francis Scott Key. Francis Scott Key is the white supremacist slave owner who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, September 13th, 1814. He wrote it during the War of 1812. Uh, he called it originally, it wasn't called the Star Spangled Banner. Originally, it was called the Defense of Fort McHenry, the Defense of Fort McHenry. And it took place during the War of 1812, and he was witnessing an attack by the British on Baltimore and on Fort McHenry in Baltimore, the Baltimore area. So what we're going to do today, we'll talk some more. We'll talk some about the history of Francis Scott Key. He was a white supremacist slave owner. He thought that African people were inferior and mentally inferior. He used his position as district attorney to Washington, D.C. from 1833 to 1840 to attack abolitionist one abolitionist named reuben crandall he tried to have reuben crandall executed and reuben crandall's crime was being caught with abolitionist material this is the man that wrote the star spangled banner now if you watch my show if you've seen any of my lectures you know i, I refer to it as the white national anthem the white national anthem 
because it was written by white people for white people about white people. It was written by a white supremacist slave owner. Some people say, now let me back up for a minute. What I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I'm dealing with something outside of the circumference of your own awareness. Um, so we'll talk some about Francis Scott Key. But also, more importantly, we'll talk about James Weldon Johnson. Who was James Weldon Johnson? James Weldon Johnson was the African-American man that wrote the lyrics to lift every voice and sing. He wrote it in 1899. Now, he did not write it for it to become a black national anthem. It was adopted later as the black national anthem a few years later after it was written. It's adopted by the NAACP and it's become the black national anthem. The reason why we needed a black national anthem is because we knew the white national anthem was not for us. And when you understand this history, you understand why. Now, as I said on my show Friday, there needs to be a new national anthem that is more inclusive of all of the different races and ethnicities here in the U.S. There needs to be a new national anthem written. And Bill Maher said something to that effect as well. OK. Uh, on on his show uh, on HBO. But we have to understand the reason why we needed a black national anthem because we knew the white national anthem was not for us. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. Then, um, so we'll do some of the history of uh, James Weldon Johnson. We'll continue to talk some about um, uh, Francis Scott Key as well. Um, then, We'll also discuss, because uh, there's some topics we didn't get a chance to talk about on um, on Friday. Um, the statue of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia was removed. We talked about this earlier in the week. The statue of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia was removed uh, this past week. It's a 21-foot statue of, um, speaking of another white supremacist, <laughs> Robert E. Lee. OK, <laughs> and this ties into the history of the Civil War. What Robert E. Lee was a slave owner also. But what's interesting about Robert E. Lee. Is that Robert E. Lee did not um, want uh, Confederate monuments and did not want statues to the Confederacy after the Civil War ended. He didn't even want statues dedicated to him. He didn't even want statues of himself. So he would he would have been against the statue of him in Richmond, Virginia. So a, a, a lot of these people who want to hold on to the memories of the Confederacy. And they're operating based upon a lie and they're supporting traitors to the Union who took up arms against the Union, like the insurrection is January 6th. Some of them are related. The, the 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 insurrection January 6th by those domestic terrorists is a continuation of the white on white violence that we saw during the Civil War, which was domestic terrorism as well. And these were uh, traitors to the Union who committed treason based upon Article three, Section three of the U.S. Constitution, which is why they needed to have a blanket pardon issued by President Andrew Johnson. Once Lincoln was after Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson gives a blanket pardon to the traitors. So we'll talk about this, but the, the statue Robert E. Lee was removed. Some people were happy. Some people were sad. But more interesting is that it was removed by uh, an African-American company. OK, and the owner of the company, his name is uh, uh, Devin Henry. Devin Henry. Uh, I got to speak to him on when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday because he was a panelist on he was a guest on Roland Martin Unfiltered. OK, so we're going to share an excerpt of uh, that interview. It just so happens he's a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, my fraternity. Just so happens he's a member. And then also James Weldon Johnson, who wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing the black national anthem just so happens he's a member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity incorporated as well. All right. So <laughs> I didn't plan it like that, but, uh, there's that we'll, 
we're going to talk some about the James Wilder Johnson deal with that history of um, lift every voice and sing why it was written in 1899 and uh we'll also talk a little bit about james weldon johnson um and the silent march of 1917 the silent march of 1917 that james weldon johnson organized as a member of the naacp the protest against lynchings in the u.s and there were 10,000 african americans marching down fifth avenue in uh Manhattan, and they were demanding uh, federal anti-lynching laws, federal anti-lynching laws. And we're still uh, demanding a federal anti-lynching law now. OK, so <laughs> we're still demanding a federal anti-lynching law. Um, it was blocked in 2020. The bill was blocked in 2020 in the U.S. Senate by uh senator Rand paul of kentucky who needs to be voted out of office okay he's the one that blocked it it was named the uh emmett till bill it was named after emmett till and he blocked it he objected to the bill being named after emmett till uh so Rand paul's an idiot he needs to be voted out of office election have con elections have consequences so we'll discuss that then um also in our second hour we're going to be joined uh, by Demond Petty, um, organizer of the Detroit Second Annual um, African Cultural Festival. The Detroit Second Annual African Cultural Festival is coming up Friday, September 17th, Saturday, September 18th, 2021. And uh, we have some information about that. It's a good event, good cultural event, good family oriented event coming up here in Detroit. And I'll be speaking at the festival on Saturday. OK, so we'll have information about that um, as well. It's going to be at Maharis Park on Avondale. All right. So we'll talk about that as well. And then um, I think we talked about this Friday. Was it Thursday? I think we talked about this Thursday on the show or Friday. All my days are running together. I don't know. I think we talked about it. I'm here six days a week uh, and teaching two classes on the weekend. And it's about to be four classes on the weekend. But anyway. Um. We know that Joe Biden uh, announced his vaccine and testing mandate, um, uh, vaccine mandate for federal employees, uh, vaccine or testing mandate for employees of companies that have 100 employees or more. And a lot of, and yeah, some people, we, now yeah, some people putting out videos on social media before he even did his address. Uh, just based upon press releases and things like that. But um, then you have you have Republicans saying they're going to sue and things, you know, et cetera, and talking about individual rights and things like this. Now, some of these same Republicans didn't have a problem violating women's individual rights in Texas when it comes to that idiotic abortion law that Governor Greg Abbott signed, that dumbass Governor Greg Abbott signed. Now, and th those are constitutional rights based upon Roe versus Wade. So they didn't have a problem with taking that away. Then Governor Greg Abbott says that his goal is to eliminate race. I mean, el el eliminate rape. He said his goal is to eliminate rape. Now, I've never heard Governor Greg Abbott say that they were going to eliminate rape before in in Texas. Well, you uh, uh, I want to know how you how, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to go around just lock up a bunch of men. The other thing is. So they got this $10,000 bounty with this idiotic bill uh, uh, out of Texas. It's $10,000 bounty uh, and, and, and it empowers people to challenge people and uh, who help with uh, abortions, things like this. Right now, are you going to put a $10,000 bounty, $10, bounty on the heads of men who get women pregnant, who then get abortions? You going to hold the men accountable too, or just the women? We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. This is to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our stories, 
our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network, subscribe now. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do what people it doesn't know. We have it on a 9:10 a.m. Superstation. 910, the super station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the super station, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call in numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, now, um, so right before the break, I was given a rundown of the topics for today's show. Uh, I just sent you an email. Uh, it, I was having a problem with Microsoft Word with the rundown sheet. I just sent you an email. Go ahead and cue clip number one up, please, from uh, Megan Kelly. Um, and you know what? I need to see if I sent you the Bill Mark clip off. Yeah, the Bill Mark clip. Uh, I need to send you the Bill Mark clip also. Okay. Um, so right before the break, we was giving the rundown of uh, the topics for today. And I, I was talking about the um, vaccine and or testing mandate that Joe, uh, President Joe Biden announced. We talked about this here on the show. Now, you have a lot of people who are um, talking about uh, presidential overreach or government overreach, things like that, right? So there is a 1905 U.S. Supreme Court case that actually backs up the uh, legal foundation of the uh, Joe Biden's argument. And, and most legal experts are saying that uh, he is on strong legal footing. There's a good article from uh, businessinsider.com that deals with how a Supreme Court decision from 1905 set the stage for vaccine mandates. And this goes back to uh, smallpox. So we'll talk to them about that as well. All right. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of her, his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here. On the African History Network show, we deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, 
the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter text the word kemet k-e-m-e-t the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter also visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com sign up for our email newsletter there as well all right yeah that's Jalen. i'm sorry our, our uh, board op tonight is Jalen. i think i said ed i have three board ops i can't we have shakita we have ed on friday and then Jalen on sunday so sorry about that Jalen. i just sent you i sent the clip to uh ed first and then i just sent it to you uh Jalen. so the bill maher clip okay we'll go to that clip second but uh we're gonna go to uh the megan kelly clip in just a minute here all right so i i, I want to go back to this this topic we talked about on friday show and we're going to expand the conversation a little bit um so now both bill maher and megan kelly have come out attacking the black national anthem lift every voice and sing uh being performed at nfl games okay uh media uh, so there was two articles i read on this one from the grill.com picked up by yahoo news and also uh one from uh media uh mediaite mediaite and the one from mediaite was really good uh and uh it actually has about a four minute clip in it from uh, her show. OK, but it, it, just very quickly here, if we look at this and then we'll go to the clip. Um, so we know that a lot of people were upset about the silent protests against police brutality and racism and white supremacy that NFL players had going back to 2016, starting with Colin Kaepernick, August 2016 by taking a knee, silently taking a knee during the, the national anthem that I call the white national anthem. If we look at this article here from Mediaite, Megyn Kelly ripped NFL for shoving race-based, quote unquote, race-based messaging on fans. Average Americans don't want the black national anthem. Now, Mediaite was wrong. I don't know if they had character limitations, but her actual statement was average Americans don't want, she doesn't think average Americans want the black national anthem performed before the national anthem. That was what she was actually saying. Okay. I don't know if media, I did this on purpose with the title of this article, or if they're, when you put in the title of the articles, like in WordPress or what have you, if they ran into character limitations, I don't understand, but to, I want to put this in the proper context. That's not exactly what she said, the way they have it here. That's not exactly what she said. So I at least want to be fair, okay? Um, she, uh, that's not exactly what she said. But here's, here, here's what happened. Uh, now, earlier in the summer, the NFL revealed plans to feed social justice messaging during the 2021 season. Those plans include permitting select messages to be displayed on players' helmets and the addition of lift every voice and sing also known as the black national anthem before uh major events with the, now with the nfl season prepped to welcome back fans and kick off week one so it started this past thursday um uh, thursday uh september 9th and they played the game here on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf which is why my show wasn't on thursday not on 9 10 we broadcast it on facebook and youtube so you can go watch the full thursday show from september 9th also on Facebook at the African History Network, the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. And the audio podcasts of these shows are, they're on nine or 10 different audio podcast platforms iHeartRadio, TuneIn, FM Player, Castbox, Stitcher, wherever you get your audio podcast from. Search for the African History Network show. Now, with the NFL season prepped to welcome back fans and kick off week one uh, of its regular season, Megan Kelly last out at the league for mixing sports and politics mixing sports and politics what she calls mixing sports and politics right now when they honor the veterans she didn't call that politics when the national defense when when when, when the department of defense when the part when the department of defense uh pays 50 million dollars to nfl teams to have patriotic displays she ain't she ain't have a problem with that apparently okay We'll talk about that here in just a minute. She said, I don't think people want politics in their sports. Kelly told her producer, Steve Krakauer. She said, I think that's why the NBA 
has taken such a hit and learned from its prior experience, the NFL doesn't seem to be learning quite as quickly. All right. Uh, the, now, the NFL has been heavily associated with the social justice messaging of Colin Kaepernick, who took a knee during the national anthem five years ago. And he wasn't protesting against the anthem. He's protesting against white supremacy and police brutality, just like uh, uh, Rosa Parks was not protesting against the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, December 1st, 1955. She was protesting against segregation on the buses. She's protesting against the policy of segregation in the city of Montgomery, Alabama. She wasn't protesting against the bus. Colin Kaepernick wasn't protesting against the national anthem. He's protesting against white supremacy and racism and police brutality, not just against African-Americans, but against people of color. So what I find very interesting is that you have people like Megyn Kelly, you have people like Bill Maher, you have other people, Trader in Chief, Benedict Donald, Donald Trump, things like this, who instead of focusing on addressing the issue that people are complaining about and working to eradicate white supremacy and racism, and racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, uh, media, health care, jobs, etc. And it uses to marginalize, subordinate and do harm to another race of people. Instead of addressing the systemic problems, they want to attack the person and sign us the person who is a, who's pointing out the systemic problem. And usually the reason why is because either one, they feel guilty or two, they benefit from the systemic inequities, the maldistribution of wealth, power, resources. So they want to silence the person who is addressing these issues. They don't want to they don't want to correct the issue. They just want to silence the person who's addressing the issues. So. For five years, critics of Colin Kaepernick and social justice messages have threatened to boycott the NFL, but the league continues to thrive. Now, people, uh, 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 Megyn Kelly said, quote, people are holding their noses and stomaching this. Uh, she said to explain why the NFL's popularity continues to grow with no sign of a bubble pop in sight. Now, what, what is very important to understand, then we're going to go to this clip, is that for, for the majority of these games, people probably won't even see them perform the national anthem. All right. Now, they had a, a they, a, a Alicia Keys performed the national anthem for uh, the game on Thursday. But if we look at this article, we look at this piece here from, uh, let's look at this piece here from the Grio, because it talked about how uh, when these games are on television, um, most of the time, uh, you know, they're a, the, the, most of the time it's not even aired when they uh, play the national anthem. So you have to ask the question, well, what are people complaining about so much? Now, also, they're going to uh, have there, there'll be six messages that they can have on their helmets. Uh, these messages include uh, not, not, not only will players continue to protest social injustices, but the league is encouraging it, permitting six different messages uh, to be displayed on helmets during games. Players can choose from end racism, stop hate, it takes all of us, Black Lives Matter, inspire change, and say their stories. All right. Megan Kelly didn't seem to like any of those uh, either. All right, let, let, let's go to this clip here. Uh, we're going to go to clip one from uh, Mediaite, from the clip from uh, Megan Kelly's uh, podcast, uh, Jalen. I want to bring you a feature we have here on the MK show called Real Talk, where we just kick around an issue that's in the news that we want to talk to you about. And today, that's the NFL, because uh, we're, we're about to get into NFL season again. The first game is on Thursday. And Steve Krakauer, my ex executive producer, is with me. So we're going to talk about it. But um, the, the plan now, Steve, this year is that they're going to allow six social justice messages on players' helmets 
uh, and they have to choose from the, one of the following six. End racism, stop hate, it takes all of us, Black Lives Matter, inspire change, and say their stories. So all these are, all these are for the most part, are, are race-based. A um, little different from last season when they were allowed to display messages like stop hate and Black Lives Matter on their helmets, and they were allowed to have the names of black people who've been killed by police, such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor on their helmets. They can also have slogans the end of, I, I feel like this is still not going to go over well. I don't think people want politics in their sports. I think that's why the NBA has taken such a hit and learned from its prior experience. The NFL doesn't seem to be learning quite as quickly. Back in the bubble season in 2000, they had, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in 2020, they had the names on the jerseys. You know, they changed the, the players' names to, to right across their jersey. Uh, now, you know, then they went away from that. The next season, the entire season that we just went through, no, you know, none of those social justice messages on the players' jerseys. NFL is sort of trailing that a little bit. But what's interesting about the NFL, I think, is that as a league, they have not necessarily embraced all of these sort of the social justice, I would say, more divisiveness um, as the NBA has, uh, as a league. You know, certainly certain players have. Yeah, but not really, I think for that reason, I mean, the ratings are crushing it in the NFL. And I would imagine starting tomorrow night with the Cowboys and, uh, and the Bucks and Tom Brady, it's going to be crushing it again. I'm sure they've been doing better than like the, the NBA did, that's for sure. Uh, but I also think that the people are holding their noses and, and stomaching this. I don't think that the average American, black or white, wants to hear the black national anthem before they hear the, the national anthem. I really don't. And it's, no, and it's no offense against people of color. It's We're one country. We're one country. We don't need separate anthems. It's a, it's a chance to come together, celebrate America, all of it, good, bad, warts and all, and then play a sports game. And not to shove politics or divisive cultural issues down the throats of the viewers who are looking for a getaway. Right. And, and I think that, that we've, we've, we've seen that in, sort of in some of the polling as well. I, I wonder a lot. You know, NFL, you think of, yes, people like to watch their teams. So there's definitely that. Fantasy football, gambling. I, I wonder how much of it, as you talk about kind of holding your nose, is like, look, I don't care about anything else other than how are my players doing? Let me just, you know, see what the, if I'm betting on this game, how they're doing. It's an insane industry. Gambling has been rising across the nation. I think now up to 20 states have uh, legalized it uh, or are on the track to legalize it. So, so how much of it is kind of like, yeah, we don't really, we're not supportive of this kind of messaging and we're just going to, we're just going to really kind of laser focus on the game that we care most you know, about. It's funny because I talked to Clay Travis on this show one time about his love of sports. And I love Outkick.com. Even though I'm yeah. not a sports person, I love to read Outkick. And Great interview, that, by the way, on Outkick. Thank you very much. Yeah, I sat with Bobby Brack, and, and we got into everything yesterday. Um, but I, he was explaining to me why so many men in particular, but women too, love, love, love sports. And, and he was saying, it's like, it's Sunday. I've had a tough week. I sit down in front of the tube. I got a beer. For two hours, I just get to sit and enjoy myself. And like, all my troubles melt away. And I was like, this is an aha moment for me. This is... That's how I feel when I watch The Real Housewives. <laughs> it's like the same okay, thing. pause it right there, Jalen. I do not want to see little messages about the Me Too movement in front of my Real Housewives. Pa- pause it right, pause right there. I don't want those women talking about politics. Pause right there. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I don't listen to Megan Kelly. But anyway, so I don't want to see messages about Me Too, things like this. Now, NFL has messages about breast cancer. NFL has messages about other causes that they, that they deem are worthy. Those other causes don't usually get backlash. The NFL is 70% African-American. The NFL is 70% African-American. They're not shoving this down people's throats. Now, if, if you look at this right here, if we go back to the article from Media, um, it tells you here, like last season, Lift Every Voice and Sing will only be performed at major league events. And will be played in addition to the Star Spangled Banner, not replace it. But what they talk about is that uh, NFL TV partners typically only air the national anthem ahead of special events such as the Super Bowl or the season's kickoff game. At home, viewers are unlikely to see either national anthem perform during most regular season weeks of the NFL meaning the league's decision bears almost no impact on the product being delivered to audiences. So you have to ask the question, what's this all really about? 
what's this all really about? Now, I think some people are just finding out there's a black national anthem because the Americans are very ignorant of history. We've talked about this before. Americans, regardless of race, are very ignorant of history. So if we now also Bill Maher, Bill Maher on uh, Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO, uh, there's an article from the hill.com. Bill Maher criticizes NFL for playing black national anthem. Now, Bill Maher's comments were a little different, kind of, kind of different than Megyn Kelly's. Still problematic, but a little different than Megyn Kelly's. We're going to go to the Bill Maher clip in, the, in a couple of minutes here, uh, Jalen. Uh, clip number five. So if we look at this piece here from uh, the hill.com and then other outlets pick this story up also. Bill Maher criticizes NFL for playing black national anthem. This is from uh, September 11th, 2021. All right. We know people commemorated the 20th anniversary of uh, September 11th. Donald Trump acted a fool once again. HBO's uh, Bill Maher on Friday Okay, so it'd be Friday, uh, September 10th on Friday, took aim at the NFL's decision to play lift every voice and sing long considered the black national anthem before games this season, calling it, quote unquote, segregation, but under a different name, segregation under a different name. I, I get the impression Bill Maher does not know the history of lift every voice and sing and James Weldon Johnson, who wrote it, and his brother Rosamond Johnson, who composed the, the who, who composed the melody for it. Now, the host of Real Time with Bill Maher commented on the NFL's 2021 uh, opening game between the Dallas Cowboys and Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which featured a performance of the song by Alicia Keys, and the, the, and she performed the Black National Anthem before the Star Spangled Banner was featured. OK, keep in mind, the league is 70 percent African-American, at least 70 percent. Now, Bill Maher said during his show on Friday, maybe we should get rid of our national anthem. But I think we should have one national anthem. Now, if you watch my show Friday, I said also you need to get rid of the white national anthem because it is the white national anthem. I said there needs to be a new national anthem that is in that is inclusive of the different races and ethnicities in this country because the one that Francis Scott Key wrote September 13th, 1814 is not inclusive. And, it, and, and so you have some people who say, well, it's just the third stanza where it says no refuge for the hiring, the hiring or the slave. No, it's the entire song. The entire song is a white supremacist song. If you understand Francis Scott Key and the history behind the song, the entire song is a white supremacist song, not just the third stanza. So Bill Maher went on to say, he said, I think when you go down a road where you're having two different national anthems, colleges sometimes now have many of them have different graduation ceremonies for black and white separate dorms. Uh, this is what I mean. Segregation. OK, so we're going to go to this. We're going to go to uh, let's go to clip five. This is an excerpt of what Bill Maher said. Then we're going to deal with some of the history of Lift Every Voice and Sing. HBO's Bill Maher on Friday took aim at the NFL's decision no, it's, to play it's a clip below that. It's, it's, it's in a tweet. Jalen, Jalen, stop the clip. It, it scroll down. It's in, it's in a tweet, and it shows a picture of Bill Maher in the tweet, the JPEG. Click that. It's like a minute and 12 seconds, something like that. I mean, to me, when people say to me sometimes, like, a boy. Yeah, that's the right one. Go ahead and play it. Okay, I guess the computer's freezing. I mean, to ahead. me, when people say to me sometimes, like, boy, you know, you go after the left a lot these days. Why? I'm like, because you're embarrassing me. <laughs> That's why I'm going after the left in a way you never did before. Because you're inverting things that I, I'm not going to give up on being liberal. This is what these teachers are talking about, that, that you're taking children and making them hyper aware of race in a way they wouldn't otherwise be. I mean, I, I saw last night on the football game, uh, Alicia Keys sang Lift Every Voice and Sing, which now I hear is called the Black National Anthem. Now maybe we should get rid of our national anthem, but I think we should have one national anthem. 
I think when you go down a road where you're having two different national anthems, colleges sometimes now have, many of them have different graduation ceremonies for black and white, separate dorms. This is what I mean, segregation. You've inverted the idea. We're going back to that under a different name. <laughs> okay. So Bill Maher said, now I hear it's called the Black National Anthem. Bill Maher, it was written in 1899. Where the hell have you been? It was written in 1899. Now you hear it's called the Black National Anthem? See, the, <laughs> I'm trying to explain to people. <laughs> Americans are very ignorant of history. All right. This is what we have to deal with when we try to get our issues, concerns met with to have a historical context. These are the types of things we have to deal with. And Bill Maher is not one of the worst ones either. And, and, and he's tone deaf and ignorant of history. So let's I, I want to look at this article here. Um, there was a good article dealing with the origins of uh lift every voice and sing and uh, i gotta pull this up i thought i had the clip here but uh, um the article uh it, the washington post has a good article dealing with this okay and this goes back to when uh beyonce performed um lift every voice and sing um during coachella i think it was during coachella okay i've talked about this article before in some of my lectures, I deal with the uh, history of Lift Every Voice and Sing as well. But if we look at this article here from uh, the Washington Post, let's pull this one up. All right, Lift Every Voice and Sing, the story behind the Black National Anthem that Beyonce sang. Lift Every Voice and Sing, the story behind the Black National Anthem that Beyonce sang. So back in uh, 2018, uh, Beyonce performed uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing um, at, uh, I think it was at Coachella, all right? And a lot of people just found out about it then, all right? Um, in a performance in front of tens of thousands of people, one of America's biggest pop stars paid homage to the song by singing singing a few lines of it. Beyonce became the first black woman to headline the Coachella Music Festival in uh, Indio, California. Her entire set complete with a drum line from, drum line from a marching band, step dancing and musicians in berets was an ode to a black culture and historically black colleges. So some people just found out about Lift Every Voice and Sing Then, I guess. But arguably the most significant moment in her show, politically and historically, was her rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing, her rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing, as it is also called uh, just before transitioning to her song Formation. Based on the response on social media, based on the response on, on social media, the performance resonated particularly with black audiences live streaming the performance at home, all right? So uh, this, when, when Beyonce performed uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing at Coachella, this was a culture shock for a lot of white, uh, for a lot of people, a lot of people in general, I guess, some, um, some white people, I guess, but it was a culture shock for a lot of them. And I guess there's some African Americans that don't know about the Black National Anthem either. So um, that's that's possible as well. But anyway, if we, uh, I want to pull this up here. If we look at this, let's see here. Let's go to this little background information on uh, James Weldon Johnson and Lift Every Voice and Sing. Now, there was an article from WatchTheYard.com called Did You Know That the Man Who Wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing Was a Member of Phi Beta Sigma? Okay. James Weldon Johnson wrote the song in 1899. 
uh, he was asked to deliver a speech commemorating the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Lincoln was assassinated. He was shot April 14th, 1865 um, at the Ford Theater. He dies the next morning at 722 a.m. OK. And we're going into a new century. Uh, 1899 is four years after Frederick Douglass died. Uh, it's three years after Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case uh, that uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruled on that uh, Jim Crow laws segregated uh, uh, street cars and different things like this. Segregated uh, trains don't violate uh, the U.S. Constitution don't violate the 14th Amendment. We talked about this in my class today. So he's asked to uh, he was a uh, he was a young poet and a school principal. He was asked to address a crowd in Jacksonville, Florida, for the coming anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And we're talking about just basically two decades after Reconstruction ends in 1877. And we're seeing a reversal of the rights of African-Americans. We're seeing a reversal in the rights of African-Americans. Just a year before this, in 1898, you have a, a landmark U.S. Supreme Court case called Williams versus Mississippi. Williams versus Mississippi challenges the poll taxes and literacy tests that uh, the Mississippi State convention voted on in 1898 the year before and put it into the mississippi state constitution to suppress the african-american vote because the majority of the population of mississippi in 1890 when the mississippi state uh, Const uh convention took place in 1890 and they voted on the 1890 the, the majority of the population in mississippi was african-american at the time okay so all this is taking place. Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Frederick Douglass dies, 1895. Mississippi State Constitution, 1890. Jim Crow laws instituted to suppress the African-American vote. The uh, Louisiana State uh, Constitution of 1898 is voted on. They adopt poll taxes and literacy tests as well. So he's asked to give this speech to commemorate the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's uh, birthday, but also talk about what's to come in the new century, okay? Now, instead of preparing an ordinary speech, James Weldon Johnson decided to write a poem. He began the poem with a simple but powerful line, a call to action, a call to action, lift every voice and sing. He paced back and forth on his front porch, agonizing over the lines of the poem. After finishing each stanza, he handed over the lyrics to his classically, classically trained brother, Rosamond Johnson, John Rosamond Johnson, who put the words to music. According to an account from James Weldon Johnson recalled in the book Anthem, Social Movements, and the sound of solidarity in the African diaspora by uh, Shana Shana L. Redman. As as he, and I'm going to flip over here to uh, the article here also. As he wrote the words evoking the struggle and resilience of his ancestors, he began to weep. He said, "I could not keep back the tears, and made no effort to do so." OK, so this is the, 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 the song is tied into the history and struggle of African people. And you have tone deaf people who have access to media who speak and show how tone deaf they are. He said a, a, as he wrote the words evoking the struggle and resilience of his ancestors, we're talking about uh, we're talking about basically uh, 22 years after. We we're talking about a little more than 20 years after Reconstruction ends, okay? And slavery ends in 1865, so you still have former slaves who are alive right now. Harriet Tubman doesn't die until 1913. Booker T. Washington doesn't die until 1915. Frederick Douglass had just passed away four years before this in 1899. 
Then to put all this in context and show you how this ain't is this is not ancient history. I study ancient history. I'm telling you, this is not ancient history right here. How many people have ever seen uh the TV show called The Jeffersons? How many people have ever seen the Jeffersons? How many people remember Mother Jefferson on the Jeffersons? Okay, Mother Jefferson was played by a veteran actress named Zara Cully. Zara Cully, Z-A-R-A um C U L L Y, Zara Cully. Zara Cully died in 1978, and they wrote it into the script of the Jeffersons. Zara Cully was born in 1892. Zara Cully was born three years before Frederick Douglass died. Zara Cully was born seven years before James Weldon Johnson wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. So when you watch the Jeffersons and you see Zara Cully, Mother Jefferson, you're looking at living history and you're looking at a woman who was born three years before Frederick Douglass died. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about the second annual uh, Detroit African Cultural Festival. We'll continue this conversation dealing with James Weldon Johnson, the history lift every voice and sing. We'll also talk about the removal of the Robert E. Lee, stat Robert e. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that will satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Hi. I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting, LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215 879 9 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. I'm Dr. Michael M. Hotel and African History Network show. We deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9 10 a.m. Superstation. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and we are live uh hope everybody's doing well uh i know we lost one or two callers uh call back in after we finish this interview okay call back in after the commercial break we'll, we'll go to the phone lines um and then also right before we go to uh i guess right before we go to uh demand uh i want to remind you that you can register for the new 10-week online course that i teach on saturdays we had class number one of from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 this is a 10-week online course that i teach class number one started on saturday september 11th we had a great class we went over we went over two hours also uh but some of the things that we talked about in uh class number one was uh you know we we start with the civil war and what led up to the civil war taking place 
okay? And we each class we go through analyze an approximately 10 year period of history to understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what happened to us after the Civil War ended, the events that took place and laws and policies that were put in place to put us in the predicament that we're in right now. OK, uh, so if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on register here. You can register for the course. It's regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Seventy dollars. It's uh, still discounted. It's going to be discounted for a few more days to seventy dollars. Click on register here. It takes you to the next page and just roll. As soon as you enroll, you can watch uh, the class we just did Saturday. There's also bonus content that you can watch uh, as well. OK, and you get some bonus lectures from me also. But some of the things we talked about in class number one was what led to the U.S. Civil War taking place. And the Civil War was 1861 to 1865. We talked about the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, where the U.S. buys 828,000 square miles of land for about $15 million from France. France has to sell this land because they're fighting against the Haitians during the Haitian Revolution. They're trying to raise money. France almost goes bankrupt fighting against the Haitians. We talked about the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848. And the ideology of manifest destiny that it was uh, Europeans, the, the U.S. was ordained by God to spread capitalism and democracy. And they wanted to take over the entire North American continent. Uh, we talk about Texas becoming part of the Union in 1845 after winning their independence from Mexico in 1836. And Texas comes into the Union as a slaveholding state. We talked about as a result of the Mexican-American War of 1846 and 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which ends the Mexican-American War, the U.S. gets Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. They get all that land for about $15 million. Mexico loses about a third of their land, and the U.S., gets all, all of this land because of the Mexican-American War, which leads to what's known as the Compromise of 1850. And the Compromise of 1850 consisted of five bills to deal with this new land that's coming into this new territory coming because of the uh, Mexican-American War. But part of one of the bills in the Compromise of 1850 was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 which you see depicted in the movie Harriet, which intensifies the abolitionist movement, okay? We also talked about the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, the founding of the Republican Party in 1854 as a direct backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And we also talked about uh, what's known as Bleeding Kansas of 1854 and 1855, which was armed conflict between pro-slavery groups and anti-slavery groups in Kansas, okay, bleeding Kansas. So those are some of the things we talked about in class number one. So as soon as you register for that, you can watch the entire class and you'll be ready for class number two uh, next week. All right, so on the line, we have brother uh, Damon Petty. Everybody calls him Kong of the, uh, now he organizes a great Juneteenth festival here in Detroit that I, I spoke at a few years ago, but he also is organizing this second annual Detroit African Cultural Festival that's fantastic as well. So we want to welcome to the African History Network show, Brother uh, Damon. How you doing, brother? Hey, uh, thank you uh, for having me here. We appreciate being here. Uh, on behalf of the uh, second annual Detroit African Cultural Festival, and uh, I just want to get the information out and uh, see if we can get us some more attention, some positive energy there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is a great, a great event, man. And you got you got the right person on the flyer, too, man. You have your Soka E on the flyer as well. So <laughs> this is a great event. So so you have a lot taking place um, uh, at this event. So uh, it's, it's taking place Friday and Saturday. OK, Friday is uh, 12 noon to 6 p.m. Saturday is 12 noon to 8 p.m. Um, let people know what's going to take place on Friday and where it's going to be. Okay, well, the location of both days for the festival is in the Harris Park, the yes. Harris Gentry Park, mm -hmm. which is located at 12550 Avondale. Um, the first day, Friday, uh, there will be uh, entertainment. This is the of the, the second day, but we're focusing on um, our cultural entertainment. We have the traditional African drummers from the Nadan uh drummers and dancers, and I believe also the youth dancers, the Al Noor 
African dance team will also be there. Yeah, they're both uh, excellent. Just, 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 just so everybody knows, mm -hmm. both both dance groups are excellent. I've seen both of them. I know the cool people. Both groups are excellent. But go ahead. Yeah, they're definitely, they're definitely earned their money right. We, you know, uh, we, they show up to these events that perform not just for entertainment, but because they want to show other young people that there's an outlet, there's a different type of dance, you know, there's a different type of beat you can make, there's a different type of drum you can play. They're also constantly advertising for interested people because we must keep this going. Right. right? As we, as we, flip over our generations with the drummers and our dancers. We need young people who are interested in their culture and in their tra and in traditions, you know what I'm saying? Because these are these are traditional songs and dances. They don't just make them up. Right? They come from the land. So we're looking for people who are ready to move their feet and who are ready to hit those drums and make sure that we keep that vibe going. So we definitely appreciate Al Noor and Nani Joppo for it constantly showing up to every type of cultural anything that we ask them to do. Uh, and not only that, but they, they help keep the uh, Charles H. White Museum going as well with all the work they do there. So we really appreciate both of them. Uh, but on um, besides that, we also have uh, several uh, local and now poets uh, and published authors. Okay. We have a few musicians that will be there. Uh, there will be, you said uh, musicians. Band, you said a few musicians. Rock out for as long as they want to. You said a few music, uh, yeah. musicians. You said a few musicians will be there. Yes. Okay. Yes. We, uh, there's a brother. I don't have my list, and I'm okay. really sorry. That's fine. That. There's a brother that uh, worked with us before. He plays the violin. Uh, he's an amazing violinist. We met him last year. Okay. Uh, during the winter, and we'll have him there. There's a saxophonist that's been coming to Jim Pink for a couple of years. He'll be there. We have youth performers. And also, I would like to say, it's important that I do say, that we are proud and happy to have our first uh, major sponsor, which is the House of Bank. And they are sponsoring our main stage Saturday. Okay, the House so of what? The House, the the house of what? The House of Bank, yes, is a dispensary. Okay, okay. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, so they are sponsoring our main stage on Saturday. So everything got to be happening on that stage. And as I said, I've been doing this 11 years. We've sent out a lot of letters to a lot of people. So we are happy to have this stage. We've had people performing, you know, under the shelters at the park and on the back of pickup truck. You know, we <laughs> make it do. We made do, you know. So we're happy to be able to present our young people and our poets and our singers with uh, a proper, you know, platform, you know, a presentable platform to be able to be seen as far as the eye can see. You know, and the head is a great park. It's right off the water. Right. It's going to be a great backdrop for them to perform. Okay. We're happy to be able to have that. G stage. Give the address so, of the park. Give the address of the park also. The address of the park again is Mahir's Gentry Park, 12550 Avondale. Okay. It's uh, near Jefferson and Connors on the east side of the city. Okay, on the east side of Detroit. Okay, in the Jefferson and Connors. Okay, so we're yeah. talking about, uh, uh, this is uh, Friday, September 17th, 12 noon to 6 p.m. And Saturday, uh, September 18th, 12 noon to 8 p.m. Okay, now this is this is a free event, uh, yeah. correct? Yes, our events uh, so far have been free to the public. We I don't really know when they will switch that around, but right now our goal is to give the culture to the people for free. We're not interested in selling our culture, right? Like we're we're like they have this is thing like we're going to get together in a drum circle that's going to happen. Right, like those drum circles happen anyway. Mm -hmm. right, we do those anyway. You know, then that's a part of what, how we live and, and how we move around in our spirit. So we're not selling the culture. Right? You're more than welcome to come and sit out and enjoy yourself. No one's going to pass a play around or anything like that. You know, obviously you're welcome to give donations. We need donations to get this going. We still have several things to pay for, like porta potties and tables and chairs. Right, right. And we ended up needing way more chairs than we thought because a lot of people want to come see these performers, you know, so... We want to make sure that we can accommodate everybody. We're still going to be practicing social distancing. Okay. So, uh, because we did this last year, we lived in our first year doing this was during the pandemic. Right. And uh, we were allowed to have a hundred, or you couldn't have more than a hundred people in the park. 
Okay. So we had to keep it limited. We had to keep the crowd down. But, you know, we social distance. We wore our masks. We did trip checks. And we, we respected each other's space, and there was no negative backlash or anything like that attached to it. So we're excited to be back again where the world is a little bit more right. opened up, but we're not going to negate uh, being safe and protecting ourselves, you know. Okay. So it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a safe time. And uh, we want to thank the Detroit Police Department for being helpful throughout all of this. And they'll also right. be out there with us. Uh, the Detroit Fire Department has also been helpful, and Parks and Rec. Like, they've really been helpful with making sure we, we got our eyes and cross our teeth. So we okay. That. So uh, now I'm speaking on Saturday, Saturday, September 18th. The event is yes. 12 noon to 8 p.m. on Saturday. Yes. Uh, I'm speaking on Saturday. You know, yes. you have any idea about what time I'm speaking so people can know? Well, well yes, yes. We would say that I would say that I can give you a window. Okay, right. that's fine. I give you a window, and we, we will we will make sure that between the time of three and five p.m. more more like three thirty and four thirty. Okay, that's fine. That will be we'll and we'll, conversation from Brother Mark. Yeah, between three thirty and four thirty. And we'll have, we'll have updates on our uh, social media platforms and our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, now what is the website? How can people get more information if people want to donate? Because as I explained to people, and as Dr. David M, as I told my friend Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, we don't do this for the money, but it takes money to do this. What's your website? Yes, sir. Okay, our website is Detroit African Culture Festival. Detroit, Detroit what? Dot com. Detroit African Culture Festival. Okay dot com yeah. okay detroit african cultural festival dot com because we're going to put it up here on the screen okay detroit african cultural festival dot com is the website you can get more information on the website as well um and then also let's see here just a second here okay um uh, also looking at the flyer here okay so uh on friday 12 noon to 6 p.m you you have the drumming circle you have food family fun the kids corner you're going to have some great things for children as well you have an, another flyer circulating around that talks about what's going on for children talk about some of the things you have for children yeah we wanted to make sure that our parents uh well first of all we want to make sure that the festival is a festival this is not a pop-up shop uh, this is a festival <laughs> okay where you're coming to uh sit out Sit out in the field, you know, bring chairs, bring tents, prepare yourself to be there for the day. It's not like walk up one end, spend money, walk up one end, and then you leave. Like, we want you to stay and enjoy yourself, allow your children to go and create a kids' corner. <laughs> there will be art uh, art, uh, art demonstrations, and they'll all have people you know, to create things and take them home with them. There'll be arts and crafts and different things going on there, thanks to Peace at Home Child Care. Uh, they are a uh, a community center daycare, right? And, and we trust them and love them. We appreciate them. A lot of our children go there. So they'll be out there. They, they're at every event, you know what I'm saying? So they'll be out there making sure that the children have something to do while their parents can enjoy the nature walks. Uh, my Harris Park has a beautiful uh, roundabout where you can walk over the bridge and see the water, and we don't allow the children to go back there. You know what I'm saying? So we only allow the adults to go back there. We want them to be able to enjoy the park. Okay. Enjoy everything else we have to offer. Meet some of our authors and artists that'll be out there. We want our community to connect with each other because we don't know the type of things that the people right around the corner are out here trying to push and make people aware of. Right. And we want the Detroit African Cultural Festival to be that type of place where we all come together and we discover some new things that need to be. Okay. All right. So you have uh, things for the children, performing artists for the children as well. Okay, now um, let's let's go back and look at this here. Okay, so uh, uh, you're gonna have live jazz poets, uh, Erica Felix and uh, E. Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. You want to say something something about that? Yes, I was gonna say that the the youth performer. We have uh, several performers, a super train major, and uh, about five or six other young people that will all be. And uh, Lord, rocking the mic and getting the crowd uh, on their feet. Uh, it's all obviously going to be appropriate uh, language and everything, but these children are working hard. We want you to come and get to know them. 
wants you to bring your children to get to know them. Because this is the thing, like, we sit and we wait for the media to tell us who is popular. Mm -hmm. Right? And sometimes there are people who live right down the street from us. Right. You know, we can choose that. Like, we can create this, though. We can decide that if my children are going to listen to rap music, it's going to be from someone their own age. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, their own demographic, yeah, you know, and they're gonna be rapping about school and parents, right. you know, and, and right. how hard it is to be a twelve year old. Right. We can buy that music and give it to our children. That music exists and those artists are right here in the city. Right. We want them to come out again, it's free, bring your children to see other children command a stage. It's not just about rap music, it's about dedication, determination and discipline. Mm-hmm. These are children who go to the studio. These are children who write lines. They they keep good grades. Like these are children who pay attention to detail, and they ma- they manage their chores and family and studio life. Like they're already doing these things, and we're on our children about being responsible and accountable. Children who are able to do all these things, they they are responsible and accountable children. Right. So they're, they're not just looking at a rapper. They're looking at a kid who's got their stuff together. Okay, very quickly. You know what I'm they're looking at right. a young person who is already trying to get their life together. Right. Okay, very quickly, because we're up against a grip break. We only have two minutes left in this interview. What's the website, social media, and um, is there a theme for this year for the festival also? Uh, give us that information. Okay, yes, I'm glad you asked me because I, I messed up our website. The website, I'm sorry, it is DetroitACF.org. Okay, I'm glad okay. you told me. <laughs> DetroitACF.org, okay. Go yes, ahead. Was, Go I ahead. Got to say, like, no, that's not what it is. DetroitACF.org. Okay. And we are on Facebook at the Detroit African Cultural Festival. Mm-hmm. And we are taking donations. Uh, we, uh, you can follow us on there and message us on there. Come straight to the website, and we can arrange that. But we're taking some cash app and Zell and Venmo. We do still need supplies, so we definitely need and, and every dollar counts. So if anyone is willing to donate, we appreciate that. All we right. want to be able to uh, bless there, our young performers. So is there a phone them. number? Is there a phone number? Is there a phone number people can contact also? Yes, yes. The phone number to be reached if they want to... Uh, just call or text or ask about any information. Uh, we have a line specifically for that. And they can uh, reach out to us. What's the number? Uh, any time of day. And the phone number is 313 All right. All right, that's Brother Damon yep. Petty uh, with the second annual Detroit African Cultural Festival taking place Saturday, September 17th, Sunday, uh, uh, Friday, September 17th, Saturday, September 18th at Maharis Park. Visit their that's website, right. DetroitACF.org, DetroitACF.org yeah. for more information. We'll see you there, brother. All right, we're out of time. Thanks for coming on today, All man. Right, brother. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Talk to you later. Peace. Okay, everybody, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, this is to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back. We'll talk some more about James Weldon Johnson and the history of Lift Every Voice and Sing and these other topics. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right. Hey, Imani, how you doing, Imani? Okay, so this is Imani. Okay. Imani put the cash app up. Uh, cash app dollar sign detroit acf okay imani works with uh brother damon with kong all right stand by with current events in history and politics education economic empowerment entrepreneurship relationships love sex health issues and much much more unfortunately many people confuse what racism is racism is a power structure it was laws and policies that put us in this predicament it's going to be laws and policies that take us out so when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a piece what it doesn't know we have it on a 9 10 a.m super station <laughs> 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and we are live. You know, this time goes by really quickly, 
uh, now, just so everybody understands, we're on, I'm on six days a week. I think I'm the only talk show host on this radio station on six days a week. We're on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. And then we're on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But Sunday, 9 p.m., that's my original time slot. I was doing that for like five years, that time slot Sundays. And then I was offered... Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight uh, back in October. Uh, we started October 12th. I think it was Columbus Day. So they caught me in a good mood. I said, yes. OK, so <laughs> we're on six days a week. If you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have information on how to listen to the show. Uh, you can listen on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. Then also download the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to iHeartRadio, search for 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, and then also search for the African History Network show on iHeart because we have our own channel there, and they have about 300 of my shows podcasted uh, there as well, okay, because we upload these shows in audio podcast format. All right, now, uh, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation has a uh, fantastic advertising package called The Godfather uh package 9 10 a.m superstation has the greatest advertising deal ever with their godfather package get 200 spots for 500 days with a must air within 30 day policy a must air within 30 day policy that is only two dollars and fifty cents per spot and they will even produce the spots for free that's right for free call renisha williams right now at 313-434-8291 renisha williams right now at 313-434 Eight two nine one. Let her know that Michael M. Hotel told you to call. Okay. So right before the break, we were talking about uh, to Brother Demond about the uh, second annual uh, Detroit African Cultural Festival, and before that, we were talking about comments from Bill Maher um, on HBO, uh, and also Megan Kelly on her podcast. Um, attacking the NFL um, for having the Black National Anthem lift every voice and sing performed at NFL games this season. We talked about Megyn Kelly on Friday and on uh, also on Friday on uh, when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered, we discussed uh, Megyn Kelly, but we didn't have um, Roland talked about it. He did. We didn't have enough time to go to the panel. I was one of the panelists. So what I was going to say on his show I said on my show Friday, go watch that. And we went through and broke down a lot of that history. Um, on Friday, on Bill Maher's show, Friday, September 10th, Bill Maher made his comment. So we only, it, um, on, on my show Friday, we only talked about Megyn Kelly's comments, all right? I found out about Bill Maher basically after the show. So we're discussing both of their comments and then we're also uh, giving a history lesson in dealing with the history of James Weldon Johnson and the Black National Anthem. Okay, lift every voice and sing. I'm going to go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation just a second, this slide here. So um, James Weldon Johnson writes the lyrics to lift every voice and sing in 1899. Now, in 19, when you have the red summer of 1919, the year after World War I ends and you have over 25 major race rides in this country, he's the one that coined the term the Red Summer. He called it the Red Summer because the streets of America were flowing with blood. That's James Weldon Johnson. OK. Uh, and he also organizes the silent march in 1917 when you have 10,000 African-Americans marching down Fifth Avenue uh, looking for uh, because they were demanding uh, uh, a federal anti-lynching law. All right. So. If we go back to this article here from uh, the Washington Post, dealing with uh, lift every voice and sing the story behind the black national anthem that Beyonce sang. Beyonce sang the song at Coachella in uh, 2018 and gave a lot of people a culture shock. And a lot of people didn't know that there was a black national anthem. OK, so James Weldon Johnson was asked to deliver a speech. Uh, he writes the song, he writes the lyrics in 1899. He was asked to deliver a speech uh, to a crowd in Jacksonville, Florida, for the coming anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And um, 
he sits down to write this speech, but he, he decides to write a poem. And instead of preparing a ordinary speech, instead of preparing an ordinary speech, he decided to write a poem. He began with a simple but powerful line, which was a call to action, lift every voice saying, okay? Paced back and forth on his front porch, agonizing over the lines of the poem. After each stanza, he handed over the lyrics to his classically trained brother, John Rosamond Johnson, who put the words to music according to the account from uh, to the an account from James Weldon Johnson recalled in the book Anthem, Social Movements, and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora by Shana L. Redmond. Now, as he wrote the words, evoking the struggle and resilience of his ancestors, he began to weep. Uh, he said, I could not keep back the tears and made no effort to do so. I could not keep back the tears and made no effort to do so. James Weldon Johnson recounted. The following year, a chorus of 500 school children performed the song at the Lincoln Celebration there in Jacksonville, Florida. The took off becoming a rallying cry uh, for black communities in the South or as one observer noted at the time, quote, a collective prayer, end quote, a collective prayer. The song was embraced as a hymn in churches and it was performed at graduation ceremonies uh, and in school assemblies. Now I remember being in school in elementary school and we sang the black national anthem at every the beginning of every school assembly. Now within 20 years, the, the NAACP adopted lift every voice and sing as its official song for generations to come it would be known widely as the black national anthem now the question you have to ask yourself is why did we need black national anthem why do we need a black national anthem because we knew the white national anthem was not for us that's why we knew the white national anthem didn't speak to our history at least in a positive way so we needed something that we created that told the story of our ancestors, not theirs. Now, as I said before, at the beginning of the show, we need a new national anthem that is inclusive of the different races and ethnicities in this country. But the white national anthem is not it. Written by Francis Scott Key, September 13th, 1814, during the War of 1812. Now, uh, okay, let's see here. Okay, so that's a little background of uh, James Weldon Johnson and the uh, Black National Anthem. All right, now, calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is uh, the call-in number if you uh, have a question or comment. I know there was a caller that we lost. Uh, did uh, we, we have anybody on the line, uh, Jalen? We have any callers? We have marathon. Marathon. Okay, a marathon. Uh, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, Marathon. Calling from Detroit, Michigan, nine ten. Okay, go ahead. Thanks for holding. Go ahead. Yep, and enjoying the show. Um, Lift every voice and sing is a musical masterpiece. Mm -hmm. It surpasses. It surpasses the song they already have. That song is racist, and I think we should have lift every voice and sing. Okay. All right. All right. Was that and it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. As far as mm -hmm. I had something else to say. Go ahead. As far as uh, Biden with the mandate, mm -hmm. I think that was that was right on time. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was right on time because it was things were getting out of hand with this virus. Right. Okay. He's doing what a president needs to do. Right. Okay, Marathon. Thanks yeah. for calling. Keep listening, man. Okay. Thanks for calling in. Uh -huh. uh, thanks for calling in. Okay. Keep listening. All right, everybody. Uh, 313 778 7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment, 313 778 7600. And on Sundays, we're on two hours earlier than we are Monday through Friday. So we 
we tend to get more callers on Sunday and we have two hours on Sunday, which is which is fine. That's my original time slot. Um, I want to go very quickly here. Let's go to this article dealing with um, Francis Scott Key. We talked about this on the show Friday, but a lot of people miss um, the fr- a lot of people miss the shows Monday through Friday because it, it, might, it comes on 11 p.m. This is an article. Now, I've done an entire lecture dealing with Francis Scott Key and the origins of Lift Every Voice and Sing and the origins of uh, the Star Spangled Banner. I've done one. Uh, it's, a, it's a lecture I do dealing with Colin Kaepernick and Colin Kaepernick's protest. And then I tie that into the history of the Star Spangled Banner. But this article here very quickly from SmithsonianMag.com. Where's the debate on Francis Scott Key's slaveholding legacy? Where's the debate on Francis Scott Key's slave holding legacy? Uh, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, September 13th, 1814, during the uh, War of 1812. Okay, the War of 1812 was uh, between the U.S. and Great Britain. During his lifetime, during his lifetime, abolitionists ridiculed Francis Scott Key's words, sneering that America was more like the land of the free and the home of the oppressed, more like the land of the free and the home of the oppressed. Okay, so very quickly here, uh, when we look at some history of Francis Scott Key, there's a picture of him. He was a slaveholding lawyer from an old Maryland plantation family. And he wrote the song that would in 1931 become the national anthem and proclaim our nation, quote, the land of the free. Now, he wrote it as a poem originally called the defense of Fort McHenry. OK. And. Uh, lyrics were put to it years later. I mean, uh, mel- a melody was put to it uh, to it years later and uh, it was named the Star Spangled Banner. He didn't originally name it the Star Spangled Banner. So in. 1814, Francis Scott Key was a slaveholding lawyer from a plantation family who, thanks to a system of human bondage, had grown uh, had grown rich. When he wrote the poem that would in 1931 become the national anthem and proclaim our nation, the land of the free, like Thomas Jefferson, Francis Scott Key not only not only uh, profited from slaves. He, he harbored racist conceptions of American citizenship and human potential. African-Americans, he said, were a distinct and inferior race of people, which all experience proves to be the greatest evil that afflicts a community. Now, this is Francis Scott Key, that man, the, the, the man that wrote the white national anthem. Now, um, so they talk about the uh, defense of Fort McHenry, the, the attack, uh, battle of Brandenburg, all, all of that. Um, I want to go down to this piece here. Francis Scott Key was district attorney to uh, Washington, to the city of uh, Washington, D.C. from 1833 to 1840. And he defended, he defended slavery, okay, attacking the abolitionist movement in several high profile cases. So when you talk about the land of the free and the home of the brave, free for who? Free for who? That's the question we should ask. Now, in the mid 1830s, the abolitionist movement gained momentum and with it came increased violence, particularly from pro-slavery mobs attacking free African-Americans and white abolitionists and other methods to uh, and other methods to silence the growing cries for abolition in a House of Representatives and U.S. Senate, a U- United States Senate inundated with petitions for abolitionists calling for the ending or restriction of slavery, calling for the ending or restriction of slavery, pro-slavery congressmen looked for a way to suppress the voices of abolitionists, just like people like Megyn Kelly want to suppress the voices of those who, like those in the NFL 
who speak out against police brutality and white supremacy and racism because white people just want to sit back and watch African-Americans entertain them. This is what this is. This is really low key, like what Laura Ingram told LeBron James, just shut up and dribble. This is what this is. Because, you know, th these these brothers out there risking chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, that I think Larry Elder has. I think Larry Elder running for governor of California. I think he has CTE. I also think Burgess Owens, a uh, black congressman from Utah, is a Republican who spoke at two uh, House of Representative hearings on reparations. And he spoke against black people getting reparations. And he's black. He's a former NFL player. I think he has CTE also. Now, I don't know for certain, but he sure sounds like it to me. Sure sounds like he has chronic traumatic encephalopathy to me. Now, in 1836, the House of Representatives, House of Representatives passed a series of gag rules to table all anti-slavery petitions and prevent them from being read or discussed, raising the ire of people like John Quincy Adams, who saw restrict, who saw restricting debate on a, an assault on a basic First Amendment right of citizens to protest, protest and petition. John Quincy Adams was the son of second president of the United States, John Adams. John Quincy Adams becomes the sixth president of the United States. John Quincy Adams also goes on to become, after he's president, he goes on to become defense attorney for the Africans on the Amistad slave ship in their U.S. Supreme Court case in 1841 that they won. Okay, he was their defense attorney, John Quincy Adams. You see that depicted uh, in the movie uh i'm gonna stop i think anthony quinn portrayed john quincy adams in that movie if i remember correctly okay now in the same year shortly after a race riot in washington dc when an angry white mob set upon um set upon a well-known free african-american restaurant owner francis scott key likewise sought to crack down on the free speech of abolitionists he believed were riling things up in the city okay he sought to crack down on the free speech of abolitionists he believed were riling things up in the city all right forget about their first amendment rights and, they, and they're fighting for human beings to be free you're enslaving human beings now keep in mind this is after this is after Francis Scott Key wrote about the land of the free and the home of the brave and all this, all, all, all these nice flowery words. OK, he's working in opposition of people who are uh, trying to free the slaves, trying to free enslaved Africans. But he thought African people were mentally inferior. OK, so this I mean, this is who you're dealing with. All right now, let's continue here. And we have a picture of him up here also. Uh, on the screen is a famous uh, painting. Now, okay, let's continue here. Um, okay, let's go back to this article from Smith, Smithsonian Mag. So Francis Scott Key likewise sought to crack down on the free speech of abolition as he believed were riling things up in the city. He pro he prosecuted a key he prosecuted a New York doctor living in Georgetown for possessing abolitionist pamphlets, possessing abolitionist pamphlets. His name was Reuben Crandall. Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, he tried to have Reuben Crandall executed for having abolitionist pamphlets, not for trying to overthrow the government, not, he, see, Fred, Reuben Crandall didn't storm the U.S. Capitol building trying to overthrow the government like the insurrectionists did January 6th. That's not that's not what he did. He just had abolitionist pamphlets because he thought slavery was morally wrong. And, you know, he's trying to he wants to end slavery and free the slaves. In the resulting U.S. case, U.S. versus Reuben Crandall, Francis Scott Key made national headlines by asking whether the property rights of slaveholders outweighed the free speech rights of those arguing for slavery's abolishment. Francis Scott Key hoped to silence the abolitionists who he tried to check this up. This is this is what he said about the abolitionists. He said the abolitionists he charged wished 
to associate and amalgamate with the Negro, end quote, associate and amalgamate with the Negro. Though Reuben Crandall's offense was nothing more than possessing abolitionist literature, he wasn't the, the insurrectionist. He wasn't beating up police officers. He wasn't talking about he wasn't talking about hanging the vice president. He wasn't destroying property and stealing mail and stuff like that, like the insurrection is January 6th, the domestic terrorist. He didn't do none of that. Though Reuben Crandall's offense was nothing more than possessing abolitionist literature, Francis Scott Key felt that abolitionist free speech rights were so dangerous that he sought unsuccessfully to have Reuben Crandall hanged. He tried to have Reuben Crandall executed. Hmm. Land of the free and the in in the home of the brave. Free for who? Read the rest of this article here. Where's the debate on Francis Scott Key's slaveholding legacy? That's what I want to know. That's from SmithsonianMag.com, official website of Smithsonian Institute. Check that out. That's from uh July 1st, 2016. July 1st, 2016. All right. Uh, I think we have Charles back on the uh phone line. Let's go back to the phone lines. Let's go to Charles. Charles, hey, thanks for holding, Charles. Welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. And we're getting some background noise from Charles. And turn down your radio. Yeah, we're getting the feedback. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just turned it down. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm all right. Go ahead. Uh, hey, uh, good, Mike. How, how you doing? My I'm all right. I was good. Uh, you know what? That national anthem is yeah. to be more from saying, right? Uh, now I was in the, in the Navy. The black, 90, the black national anthem. Lift every four, lift every voice and sing the black national anthem. Is that what yeah. you said? Okay, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Now when I was in the Navy, 90, 92, 94, mm -hmm. uh, we had a six month Mediterranean crew from ninety two to ninety three. And if we were doing February, we mm -hmm. was allowed to have Black History Month in the ship's library, but we were instructed we could not sing that song. Okay, this is nineteen ninety three. Okay, they they would not they would not let you sing "Lift Every Voice and Sing." You know that we could not sing "Lift Every Voice and Sing," which they knew was the national black anthem back then. Right, we could not sing. They was, we was allowed to have Black History Month, mm -hmm. but we could not sing that song. <laughs> Did they give a reason why? 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 No, no, they just said we couldn't. We knew what it was. It was racist. We knew. <laughs> Which book is that? Somebody, they put the interjected. Which book is that? The Battle of the Dash. Okay. And the Battle of the It's a five-part series by Christian Jack. Okay. Uh, they did it all over ancient Egypt, yeah. And I got the uh, uh, the Battle of the Dash. In, in the book, uh, you were saying, oh, you want to pick up the last one. And, uh, I, yeah, so anyway, I ended up reading it, bro. And uh, you can see the interjected quotes of him, of Moses. Mm -hmm. I mean, this man is the king of Kemet. Uh, 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 about to go to war with, with, with the Syrians, and he look up for Moses. He, he got to talk to him. Where's my boyhood friend Moses? You could just hear the energetic, see the energetic quote. Okay, this man, the King of Kings, ain't looking for no dog on Moses. You know what I'm saying? I just want to touch on that. Right. I mean, we talked about that was fiction. But yeah, back to what we were saying. Uh, yeah, that, that's 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 that, that's that's that don't make no sense. Uh, and and, and, and if you want to see on the vaccine, I'll let you speak on that. Okay. Uh, well, I got to go to this clip, man. We only got 10 minutes left in the show. Call back tomorrow night. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 We, we can't. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, Charles. Thanks for calling. Okay. Uh, everybody also, uh, um, Jalen, we're going to go to the clip, uh, from, let's see, what is that clip now from uh, Rachel Maddow show? Okay. Dealing with Biden and vaccine mandate. We're going to go to that next because we run out of time here. Um, read this article. We talked about this on our Friday show. Read this article. This is from the Washington Post back from, uh, I think this was 2016. 
report at least 50 teams were paid by Department of Defense for patriotic displays. At least 50 teams were paid by Department of Defense for patriotic display. So with um, Megyn Kelly saying that people don't want politics interjected in the sports. Right. Um, I, I noticed when we played the clip from the show and in the comments she made, she didn't talk about this right here. The Department of Defense uh, spent. It was about fifty million dollars over a number of years for patriotic displays. Okay, at sporting events, NASCAR was the biggest recipient, getting one point five million dollars for fiscal year twenty fifteen. Included were personal appearances uh, by um, let's see, uh, included were personal appearances by Auric Almarola and Richard Petty, as well as 20 Richard Petty driving experience ride alongs. The expenditures, according to the Department of Defense, were integral to its recruiting efforts. A NASCAR official. OK, let's scroll down, read the rest of that. Um, this was a study. This was a report from senators at the time, John McClain and Jeff Flake of Arizona. The report was called. Uh, Tackling Paid Patriotism, a joint oversight report. The 145 page report cites contributions to 18 NFL teams, 10 Major League Baseball teams, eight NBA teams, six National Hockey League teams, eight soccer teams, as well as NASCAR, Iron Dog, and Indiana University. The Atlanta Falcons, for instance, were the top recipients getting $879,000 over four years. Over the same period of time, for instance, the New England Patriots received $700,000 and the Buffalo Bills $650,000. Okay. And this is for various patriotic uh, displays. Okay. With the military and things like this at games. So it's, is it, isn't that politics as well? interjected into all these sports. I just find it interesting when you have people like Megyn Kelly who object to the Black National Anthem being sung, and oftentimes it's not even going to be televised. They have a problem with that, but they don't have a problem with things like this. Okay, very quickly here, let's go to this. I'm going to go to this, um, this last story here, and we'll talk some more about this on tomorrow's show. So on Friday's show, it was either Thursday or Friday, we talked about uh, Biden's vaccine mandate, people saying this, oh, is overreach, things like this. They didn't, they didn't deal with the U.S. Supreme Court case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts from 1905. I want to go to this clip, from, clip here from the Rachel Maddow show, which gives some background information on this. Let's go to this clip, uh, Jalen. The United States Supreme Court has ruled multiple times, going back more than a century, that it is not unconstitutional to require Americans to get a vaccine, even if a person doesn't want to. In the context of a serious public health threat, you can be required to be vaccinated. They ruled that way back in 1905 in the context of a mandatory smallpox vaccine requirement in, in Massachusetts. They ruled that way in 1922 in the context of vaccines being required of students if they wanted to attend school. The Biden administration's new rule that employees have to be vaccinated at all companies that have more than 100 employees, that rule is going to be enforced through OSHA. OSHA is the part of the Labor Department that was created by a law Richard Nixon signed in 1970. So we'd have an agency that regulates workplace conditions. As the Times notes today, quote, experts say the Biden administration appears to be on strong legal ground because it's relying on existing authority granted to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, granted to OSHA by the legislative branch and supported by decades of judicial rulings. And you know what? You put those things together, right? Evidence, current evidence, that it works for the current pandemic. Lots of historical precedent, not only for it working, but for it being successfully and legally implemented in our country clear, uncontested Supreme Court precedent going back more than a century, making it clear that this is absolutely constitutional policy. And on top of that, decades of judicial rulings all going the same way on these kinds of core questions. You line all those things up, and that used to be the kind of thing that would make a person confident <laughs> in how these you know, blustery, chest-pounding, promised lawsuits against the president's policies would be struck down by the courts. But part of what has been heavy in our news this year, part of what has felt sort of unrelenting in our news this year, 
is the radicalism of the Supreme Court right now, stacked with three Donald Trump appointees. He was president for one term and was impeached twice. But Republicans gamed the system to get him three appointees on the court, which only has nine members total. Overall, the nine-member court is stacked with six Republican appointees, three of them appointed by Donald Trump. And in a court like that, frankly, they have been delighted to throw out, you know, 50-year-old precedents like, say, Roe versus Wade, just in order to get what they want. With Republican elected officials and the conservative media going bananas against what President Biden is stepping up to do on COVID, should we expect the stacked conservative courts, including the Supreme Court, to just join in in the right-wing chorus trying to stop these policies, trying to, trying to stop these policies to that are, that are trying to stop COVID? Or is the administration actually on firm ground here? What should we expect as this fight starts? Joining us now is Jamal Green. He's a constitutional law professor at Columbia University. Professor Green, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thanks for making time. Good to be here. Thank you. First of all, let me ask you if the basic approach here um, that I'm, by which I'm looking at this is right. It seems to me as a non-lawyer and as an observer of these things that both in terms of the implementation through OSHA and in terms of the broader question of whether or not there can be vaccine mandates in America, there does seem to be pretty solid precedent that this is within the government's power. Is that, is that the right way to look at it? Would it have to be a departure from sort of settled precedent for these measures by the, by the current administration to be overthrown? Yeah, I think you've got it about right. Uh, I, I would add one important additional okay. point. Which hey, is pa pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there. Okay, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting. We'll finish up this clip. We'll talk about this uh, some more on tomorrow's show. We're on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can support us, dollar sign, The AHN Show, through Cash App and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash The AHN Show. And be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and register for uh, my new 10 week online course from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Right now, it's correct. It's wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Stand by. Stand by. OK, uh, let's continue. Let me cue this clip up here because we're only on 19 for two hours and they were running the clips from their side. So let me cue this one up uh, just a second here. Um, you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for this uh, new 10-week online course. Class number one start up Saturday, September 11th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions, we do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch it over and over again. Uh, and then even after the 10-week online course is over with, you still have... Um, you can still go watch the entire course uh, as well. Okay, the class is regularly $130. It's on sale, uh, $70 right now for a very limited time only. It's on sale, $70. And there's bonus content uh, also. You get six additional lectures from me as well um, with the online course also. Okay, let me grab this clip here, and then we'll finish this up. And then we have to get out of here. I had to teach a two hour class today. All right, let's cue this up here. This other topic dealing with uh, the Robert E. Lee statue taken down in the segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered, where we talked to uh, Devin Henry. Devin Henry is the African American man who owns the company that took the statue down. We'll share that uh, interview on Monday's show because we're out of time here. All right, stand by. I got to get past this uh, commercial here. All right, let's see here. Okay, let's go back to this. Joining us now is Jamal Green. He's a constitutional law professor at Columbia University. Professor Green, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thanks for making time. Good to be here. Thank you. 
First of all, let me ask you if the basic approach here um, that I'm by which I'm looking at this is right. It seems to me as a non-lawyer and as an observer of these things that both in terms of the implementation through OSHA and in terms of the broader question of whether or not there can be vaccine mandates in America, there does seem to be pretty solid precedent that this is within the government's power. Is that is that the right way to look at it? Would it have to be a departure from sort of settled precedent for these measures by the by the current administration to be overthrown? Yeah, I think you've got it about right. Uh, I, I would add one important additional point, which is, you know, we keep talking about these as if they're, they're mandates, vaccine mandates is the, the, the language that people use when they attack it. But this isn't even a, a vaccine requirement, right? It's you get a vaccine, the employer has to have, have uh, vaccination, or they can provide uh, for weekly testing. That's the other option. The law that was upheld in 1905 in Massachusetts, which was the smallpox vaccination law, was one where there was a criminal fine associated with not getting vaccinated, and it, it applied to individuals, not to employers. Right. So the Supreme Court has already upheld a much more severe a vaccination requirement than uh, than is at issue here. Right. So based on current law. The idea that you have a right to avoid this kind of being put to this kind of choice uh, is, is basically frivolous. As you say, who knows with the, the current Supreme Court, they could always um, they could always change their minds. But but this is a very so they're on very solid ground here. Now, when it comes to the to the to the Occupational uh, Safety and Health Act, the OSHA enforcement, that's a little bit closer because uh, there haven't been that many times when it's been invoked in this kind of emergency way. But, but again, the, the statute is designed for the government to be able to regulate workplace safety. Um, this seems to me to be quite, quite clearly within the mandate of the, of the agency. One of the other ways that the president is really expanding the number of people to whom, um, from whom vaccination is expected or required as a, as, a, as a provision of their job is by using Medicare and Medicaid funds. Do you think that those things may have tripwires for the Biden administration now? I think any, any lawyer would be naive to say that there's no, no tripwires here. For, for decades and decades, as, as you've suggested, there were effectively no limits on the kinds of conditions that the federal government could attach to spending programs like Medicaid and Medicare. With the Affordable Care Act case, that, that, that all changed um, about a decade ago. And now I think any, any um, conditions that um, seem to be unusual or seem to be um, onerous uh, might uh, might trigger um, some courts to be skeptical. Now, these kinds of requirements are, of course, very common sense in the, in the context of, of, of health care. You want to make sure that health care workers are not infecting their patients, right? So this is entirely reasonable, and that would be the kind of a test that would have been used in the past. But it, it, as, you've, as you've suggested, um, with the ways in which issues around this virus and this pandemic have been politicized, it's very hard to know if a, a court might reach out and see this as an opportunity to, to kind of um, nip at the administration. Okay. All right. That's from, um, that's from the Rachel Maddow show on this Friday, September 10th, actually. The clip says September 11th, but it's actually Friday, September 10th, because the show doesn't come on on the weekend. Um, so you can check that out, check out that clip. And then also this article here from Politico business insider.com has uh, a good, really simplified article, how Supreme court decision from 1905 set the stage for vaccine mandates, but also this more extensive article from Politico, Politico, um, uh, .com, the surprisingly strong Supreme court president precedent supporting vaccine mandates this one here this is an extensive article from politico that deals with uh jacobson versus massachusetts as well and i think they did some other cases also this is from september 8th 2021 uh from politico all right so check those out as well okay look we have to get out of here uh, we'll talk about this some more tomorrow and uh, we'll share the uh excerpt from uh, Roland Martin and filtered when I was on Friday, uh, September 10th, so Friday, September 10th. And we talked to Devon Henry, who uh, owns the company 
that took down the statue of General Robert E. Lee, the 20 foot statue of General Robert E. Lee uh, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, this past week. And it's an African American owned company. So we'll talk about that on uh, tomorrow's show. All right, if you'd like to stop your information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and at our website, African History Network.com. Um, this is our official Cash App tag, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And uh, when you go to it it uh say michael and show my picture there these other ones are fake african history Net network cash app accounts i did not set those up so we have six days a week this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills etc um as i said at the top of the show we had oh i gotta remind you this also um i will be so saturday september 18th i'm at maharis gentry park for the uh second annual detroit african cultural festival and then also I am um, September 26th, I'll be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History for the uh, screening of the documentary Hapi. This is the Hapi City Tour and uh, Brother Taki Grant and uh, some of the people from the documentary uh, Hapi, which deals with african history and economic empowerment some of them will be here in detroit and on the panel the film stars professor jane small and dr wade nobles and uh dr julian malvo and uh many others so i gotta get the exact list of who's going to be here i'll be moderating the panel discussion uh this is taking place sunday september 26th 2021 3 p.m uh eastern standard time i think it's going like 3 p.m to 8 p.m something like that get your tickets at hapifilm.com hapifilm.com they're going to do a screening of the documentary then we'll have a panel discussion as well it's going to be fantastic uh there'll be uh in, so come on out visit hapi uh, hapi h-a-p-i hapifilm.com to purchase your tickets and we'll have taki on the uh, on the show probably sometime this weekend and next Sunday, we're going to try to get Professor James Small on the show. I have to reach out to him. I'll talk to him. Uh, well, we were, well, we, um, Professor James Small and I, we were on a um, a virtual tribute to Renoko Rashidi a couple of weeks ago because we know Renoko Rashidi passed away August 2nd. Uh, Taki Grant, director of the film Hapi, um, he had interviewed Renoko a number of times before and was good friends with Renoko. So uh, Taki organized a virtual tribute to Renoko Rashidi. So I'm on that panel discussion. Uh, so I talked to Professor James Small then. And, and actually, you know, Professor Small is one of the people I talked to to confirm that Renoko had passed away as well. Uh, I talked to Professor Kabahai Watha Kamene and Professor James Small. Uh, so we'll get Professor Small here on the show, uh, hopefully next Sunday. All right. So go to hapifilm.com and uh, purchase your tickets. We'll see you there Sunday, September 26th at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. Uh, be sure to register for the new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Like I said, class number one started up on Saturday, September 11th. As soon as you register, you can watch it because uh, we do the class live, all the sessions are recorded. You can see me, I can't see you, so you don't have to worry about me seeing you or anything or having to, you know, get dressed for the class or anything like that. Uh, you can ask questions in class. We have a live text chat also, so you can ask questions. Now, some of the things that we talked about in class one. So each class we go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history to see what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place? Um, reverse reversing gains that we made during reconstruction things like this so in class number one um we start with events that lead up to the civil war taking place civil wars 1861 to 1865 so in class number one some of the things we some of the things we discussed were uh events leading up to the civil war taking place